Hello, I'm Will Hitchcock. And I'm Siva Vadianathan. And from the University of Virginia's Deliberative Media Lab, this is Democracy in Danger. When I think about the rising political threats to democracy around the world, in Europe, in the United States, in India, so much of it seems to be driven by reactions to the perceived threats of human migration. We've seen refugees from war, refugees from crime, spark xenophobic and racist backlash all over the world. So I'm I'm very concerned that as climate change drives people away from vulnerable places toward cooler, more stable parts of the world, we're only going to see this backlash increase. Siva, I think you have reason for concern. I mean, there's a lot of worrisome news to consider. Rainforests are disappearing at at a shocking rate. The polar ice is melting. Ecosystems are collapsing before our eyes. We're seeing more extreme weather patterns, sea levels are rising, and even uh, the pandemic that we are enduring now and that we've endured for over a year, uh, these may become more frequent as time wears on. Yeah, there are so many ways that climate change is affecting our lives, and we can only see more of it in the future. And if we care about not just our quality of life, but the health of our democracy, we really have to ask this question, how does climate change affect democracy? If you look at it, of the top six carbon emitting nations, four of them, the United States, India, Japan, and Germany, are democracies, uh, at least for now. Yeah, Siva, I I think we can draw a line between the planetary crisis we're experiencing and the political crises that democracies are in today. At the very least, we're going to need some you know, strong democratic institutions to fix the climate crisis. Well, fortunately today, we have one of the country's foremost science journalists with us on the show to help us understand the scope of the problem and in particular its political implications. Kendra Pierre-Lewis is a reporter and writer and a producer on the podcast, How to Save a Planet. She previously wrote for the New York Times Climate Desk, and she's the author of Greenwashed, Why We Can't Buy Our Way to a Green Planet. Kendra, welcome to Democracy in Danger. Thanks so much for having me, Will. Well, Kendra, before we dive into these big questions about the planetary crisis, can I just ask you to tell us a little bit about how you came to science writing? I mean... I imagine it's partly an immensely fun job. One of the things that we found so impressive about your work is your photography, especially from the Arctic, which seems a stunning and beautiful place. But also, I'm guessing that there are times when it's pretty challenging to bring to the public what is uh, a lot of bad news. Yeah, so um, I got into science writing through the environment, really. I actually majored in economics in college, and then I eventually got a master's degree in sustainable development. But I've just always, even in college, I just sort of had this very persistent interest in the environment and in environmental issues. And I also was a a writer kind of from an early age, not for public consumption, but just sort of the thing that I did on the side. And I became a journalist sort of, it's my second career. I transitioned into it full time five or six years ago. And it was just really sort of wanting to marry this interest in science and the environment with my interest in writing. So not long after Joe Biden was sworn in as president, Dr. Anthony Fauci gave a press conference in which he suggested that pandemic policies were now able to go forward free of political interference. You know, he he said, let the science speak. So, you know, I guess what he was saying is that science is fundamentally not political or maybe should not be political. But, you know, historians have reminded us time and time again that the choices we make about what to study and how how to move on from what we learn is, in fact, highly political. What forces today do you see that are most effectively trying to delegitimize the science of climate change? Yeah, I feel like there are kind of three strands of it. There are entrenched fossil fuel interests, which I think has been well chronicled. And so obviously those people are financing deliberate misinformation and that has continued to carry on sort of since the 1970s through to the present moment. There's another strand, which is climate change is something that is very difficult for people to wrap their heads around. And there's this idea that 
adapting and mitigating climate change will require a level of change that we're profoundly uncomfortable with. And you sort of hear it from the very beginning of the climate conferences, like the Rio conference in 1992. Um, President Bush, the first President Bush, he said the American way of life is non-negotiable, right? So there's this undercurrent that like there's deliberate misinformation that like the climate isn't warming or that it's not human caused. There's a second strain, which is like, yes, the climate is warming and yes, it's human caused, but we don't want to do anything about it because we don't want to change the ways in which we live. And then I think there's this third strain, which is just in action because people don't know what they can do. When you talk about that second strand, a kind of conceptual difficulty to imagine changing or adapting to new realities, I just wondered, you know, what's funny is we live in a, mo in a time of rapid technological change, constant technological change. I guess I guess human beings have always lived in such times, but everything is just accelerating so rapidly. We're pretty good at adapting to technological change. Why is it that there's a conceptual fear of the ways in which we might have to change in the face of, of a changing climate? Is it a pocketbook thing? Is it a, you know, where does it pinch, I guess is what I'm getting at. Where, where is the conceptual obstacle to saying we have to change our ways in order so that the planet won't melt down? Yeah, I think for some people, technological change can feel like a choice. And I'm emphasizing feel like a choice because at a certain point, it's no longer a choice, right? There are millions of people who don't have broadband for reasons that are outside of their control. And because they don't have broadband, they are systematically locked out of certain things. If you don't have broadband, it's hard to get a vaccine appointment, right? Like, like they're, they're like systematically locked out of things mm. of which our society is based upon. But it still feels like a choice to buy high speed internet, it still feels like a choice to buy a smartphone, whether or not it actually is a choice anymore is a separate conversation. And I think for a lot of people, it feels like they're, they're not being able to choose. Like, what do you mean? I'm not going to be able to have my giant truck anymore. Ah. Or what do you mean? I'm going to have to take mass transit or I'm going to have to, you know, buy an electric vehicle or something. So I think part of it is it feels like people feel like they're getting their choices taken away from them. But I feel like what's missing in that argument is that climate change is taking the choices away from them anyway. And so <laughs> the question is, is like, to what degree can we control and plan for how some of those changes are going to happen? It's going to be by force or by choice. And that's that's the big key here, right? I mean, we need people to think about the fact that their lives are going to be constricted in some pretty serious ways that will render their big television largely irrelevant, as we saw in the entire state of Texas not so long ago with rolling blackouts caused by extreme weather. And we know that extreme weather is going to increase. And and you've made this connection right here with us between the the passion for consumption and the bind we have put ourselves in, always needing more, wanting more, having to go farther and faster. And that has been the mindset of so much of humanity for a century, if not longer, right? So, you know, unwinding that is going to be tough. Now, you know, we often see this expressed, though, in individualistic terms, right? If consumerism is a part of the problem, we assume that, oh, well, if I just choose to buy less or buy buy a Prius or buy this kind of washing detergent, things will get better. Yeah. You know, in your book, Green Washed, you make it pretty clear that what I'm just saying is way too simple. Please tell me why. I mean, there are like kind of a few reasons why it's way too simple. First is like your consumption can be easily offset by somebody else's yes. consumption, right? So yes. that's simple. Um, one of the places we fixate a lot is in diet, but diet in particular is one of the places where we least have social control. Like I think a lot of this goes back to this very simple belief of supply and demand, which is like if I stop consuming X product, that will reduce the demand for it. And so the supply chain will change. But the way our food system in the United States is structured, it is so much based on um it is just way wonkier. It is like yeah. so based in policy like and in incentives. Supply, supply and, leads to supply. You know. Yeah. And, and, and also just like how farmers get paid is not the way that people think farmers get paid. They often get paid through like money from the federal government. It's not like, well, if I stop buying churros from the churro guy, he will stop selling churros. Like, yes, in, in a normal world, that's true, but that's just not how ag systems work. And so there's just one element where many of the things that we're doing is just so convoluted that our direct consumption just can't touch it. There's also the fact that like it doesn't at all in any way change the broader supply chain. We need to take a step back and sort of zoom out and look at the not just what we're consuming, but the systems that that's embedded in. And then, of course, there's the belief that 
because I can opt out or you can opt out that everyone can opt out. And that's just not true. They're often costs associated. There are just other things that not everybody has equal access to. The other thing that I, I kind of wanted to get at, Siva, is that you were talking about like sacrifice, but I think the other side of the, this, and I don't want to um, put rose colored glasses or silver lining on the pandemic, but I think one of the things that has come out of the pandemic, and I feel this, I don't know if you feel this, is that we were spending so much time and, and energy running around to stay in place. And I think a lot of people are like, I definitely want to, I want to see my friends. I want to hug my loved ones. But I think a lot of people are kind of emerging from the pandemic with the desire for things to be slower. Like the pace that we were living in, this pace that we've adopted, this rate of technology change, it's killing us. It's not bringing a lot of us joy. Mm -hmm. Boy, is that ever true? I mean, I, in the, in the 18 months before the pandemic, I traveled almost every week for academic things of one kind or another. And in retrospect, I look back and say, what was that all for? What what really fundamentally was that all for? Well, it was, Could, it was how all much for it, the miles on, it, on your airline on my, on my, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It was all to get Let's more miles. Actually, you do start being like, God, I've got to get more miles. So you're on to something. I mean, slowing down is actually something that uh, we could we could perhaps do more. But kind of follow up on Siva's question about technology. I just wanted, you know, where technology, it seems, could be a solution in some ways to climate crisis, but you also, I think, have talked a little bit about the way the actual construction, the building of the technology itself, the hardware, not just the software, may be part or at least one part of the problem. I mean, accelerating climate problems. Can you walk us through that again? Yeah, it's just that, you know, it takes materials to make things. And if we use up those materials and then we throw them out very quickly, if that throughput sort of speeds up, then you're taking a lot from the environment faster than you can replace it. And also the process of making things releases a lot of carbon emissions. So you should hold on to things for a really long time. I have, I, I came across this funny statistic um, and it was about cups, you know, cause there's all of this conversation about whether or not, you know, how polluting are disposable water bottles and like our you know, durable water bottles better. And um, it was about ceramic cups, so like your mug, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it said something like you need to use it at least 17 times for it to offset the use of like disposable cups. Wow. And I was like, in what world is it unusual to use a mug 17 times? I have like an obscene number of mugs apparently. <laughs> and I'm like, I've definitely used all of them at least 17 times in the past nine months. <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> right. it seems doable. Yeah. Well, let, let's... uh. Let's look more globally, right? Because we do, I think, to our great peril, focus too much on our personal choices when I am but one of 7.4 billion of us and my choices make almost no difference in the aggregate. So are we up to this task in terms of our global instruments of governance? Are we up to this task in terms of global awareness and concerns. I mean, one of the things we've experienced over the past four years is the United States of America, the greatest contributor to climate change, has basically receded from the public global discussion and policymaking process of how to address climate change by pulling out of the Paris Accords, for instance. Now, you know, we're back in officially, but have we lost all credibility? And what would you hope to see at the global level to be able to address this problem with the urgency it needs? Yeah, I think we have lost a lot of credibility, but I think it's also worth pointing out that sort of since the inception of the climate conferences, the United States has always been a bad actor. We've never <laughs> been the leader. We've repeatedly sort of undermined any attempts at kind of global cooperation and reigning in climate change. I also think it's really important that countries are not equal when it comes to climate change. And there are plenty of countries that have contributed very little to this problem and are begging us to change our behaviors. You know, because of the pandemic, I think the multiple cyclones that hit Central America this year just didn't get the level of attention that they should have. And while we can't say definitively, you know, that this specific hurricane was caused by climate change, we know that climate change is making hurricanes worse and they were unusual storms. I, I think when the second storm hit, there were no structures destroyed because they'd all been destroyed by the first hurricane. Like this is what we're talking about, right? Like there needs to be a system, I think, globally of helping of reparations, essentially. Like it's an unpopular word. Mm. But we need to be paying countries that did not create this problem to adapt and to mitigate um, and to rebuild 
build, you know, like the green climate fund, there just needs to be more happening on that level. And on the one hand, you, you can, you can pretend that it's not our problem and, and leave these countries to their own devices. But I, one of the things that got lost during the whole quote unquote migrant crisis, which is a problematic term, is that many of those people were coming from Central America, which was hit by a drought that has been heavily linked to climate change, right? Like we can't close off our borders. And then on the flip side is that like, much of the ways in which the United States is considered resilient to climate change has not to do with our exposure, which means we're, it's not like we're not going to get hit. We're not gonna, it's not like we're not going to have wildfires. We're going to have wildfires. We're going to have heat waves. We're going to have hurricanes, but that we have the wealth and the capacity to adapt to that. And if nothing else, the pandemic has, <laughs> has shown us the hubris in that assumption. Well, so reparations is not an unpopular word here on Democracy in Dangerous, <laughs> you know. It's it's actually a word we take quite seriously and a, and a concept we take quite seriously. Uh, it also, though, I think fits really well with this if you add a letter before it and make it preparation. So yeah. we can imagine a system by which the wealthy countries of the world, the wealthy North, or you can throw China in there as well, would have to subsidize some sort of coping processes and defenses mm -hmm. for the most vulnerable sites in the world, Central America, the island nations of the world, uh, places where agriculture is just on the brink of completely collapsing and have a flow of capital that allows for um, intensive diversification, uh, soil retention, all of these really creative programs that can stem the immediate damage. And you can imagine tying that fee or that tax to carbon emissions. So nations that are wealthier, that are donors to this system would be relieved of their duty as they decrease their carbon output. I think I'm just making up a global policy off the top of my head. Is this, is this something close to what's being discussed? Is this just me dreaming impossible things and winging so, it? So so in the Paris Climate Agreement, there is language around that. That's kind of part of what the Green Climate Fund was supposed to do. Okay. Uh, well, it doesn't explicitly tie it to like a tax and carbon emissions, like where the money comes from within a given country is up to that country's choice. We also have to make sure that how that money is distributed doesn't reproduce problematic colonial relationships and neocolonial relationships and doesn't sort of mirror a lot of the problems with the way aid and development Absolutely. happens currently. Like there needs to be a lot of uh, autonomy within the nations and sort of like they get to direct how that money gets used. Um, during the last big UN meeting before the pandemic, the U.S. basically went out of its way to kind of shut that down. And basically most global North countries are really Really reticent to accept responsibility. They don't want to acknowledge culpability. So science can't tell us what to do. It can only tell us really the outcomes of our decision. Right, right. Well, so if we recognize the limits of science in its ability to express value and lead us toward decisions that can ensure the flourishing of our species, of our children. And we can't count on my decision to buy a hybrid car as something that is going to flip the switch on climate change. Uh, what do we have left to us? How can we express our will and our concern as citizens in this current system? There are a few things. There's, um, you know, Social science. <laughs> so, um, you know, on the side, I have been working on this piece for Slate, which is about shame and how important shame is to our society and the role of shame. And part of it was a reaction to all of these stories that came out in the middle of the pandemic, which was like, you shouldn't shame people for violating COVID protocols. And if you're talking about, you know, like an essential worker who has to go to work because our government completely failed in containing the pandemic, that's a separate conversation. And I don't, I'm not <laughs> at all an yeah. advocate for that. Right, but right. if you're on Instagram and your uncle is like going into stores uh, without a mask and making a scene, you absolutely should get on his Instagram and be like, uncle, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. How dare you? Right? Like, <laughs> like shame actually forms a role in society. And oftentimes when people are having these knee jerk reactions to get shame, they're either rejecting the norm, right? Like there are all sorts of norms that shame people for things that shouldn't be shamed, 
or they're thinking about how they would feel in that position. But the reason that you don't want to be shamed is because it's a horrible thing. It's a loss of social reputation. And so I feel like we don't talk enough about values. The values become very implicit, but value systems are how things change. It is like how gay rights have changed, what we're seeing right now with a lot of movements for racial justice. That's changed. I talked to a farmer who opposes the Keystone Pipeline in 2017. He's a Republican. He's a Christian. He did not approve of the Trump administration at the time. It was a value change for him. And at the end of the conversation, he was like, yeah, I stand in solidarity with the native peoples of British Columbia. So how do you get from a farmer in Nebraska who actually in the beginning wanted the Keystone Pipeline on his land to that, right? That is a values change. And it's not a Correction, it's not even a full values change. This is clearly a person who cared about other people who had love in his heart. It is making him recognize the things that he was doing or the ways in which this pipeline were coming through did not reflect that broader love in his heart. That's powerful. But and it 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 makes me want to ask if you can continue that thought to connect climate science and the information that we're now being presented with about dramatic changes that are occurring around us and democracy as a form of government. I mean, in a sense, what you're hinting at is people can change if they if they align, you know, data with their own personal values, maybe. But that tends to happen best in an environment where there's no fear of political persecution if you change your mind. And that would be ideally a, a, a functioning democracy. Am, am I, is this Pollyannish or is <laughs> no, this, do we need democracies the... to fix the climate crisis? I'm just trying to connect the whole scene. Yeah. And I mean, I want to be careful without going globally because I don't, I you know, different countries have different norms and different political systems and it's difficult. But I think in this case, the people that he was talking to were not, and this has come up a few times, like I went down to North Carolina and I talked to people who were opposing a coal ash um, plant. The people they were talking to were generally by and large people within their own community. So this is friend to friend. And they were the ones that were having these discourses and were able to change people's minds. And I think going back to democracy, one of the things that I find really frustrating, and I'm pretty vocal about this on Twitter, is the way in which we talk about political reporting. Political reporting often reports on national issues, so like DC. And also it reports on it like it's a sports game. So it's like a thing we're watching and observing, not things that we are participants in. And, you know, I've talked to a number of reporters and I'm sort of in the same boat where until I became a climate reporter, I didn't understand the public comment period, right? Like, like, Like there are all of these like functions of democracy that we, the way in which we talk about democracy in the United States is every two years you show up at the polls and you vote. And that is kind of the full and like very special people run for public office. And then that's kind of like all we do. We don't talk about community planning board meetings. We don't talk about school boards. We don't talk about any of these things in a way that illustrate that that this is a participatory democracy and that there are ways that we can engage with it. And so I think that is also really important. Well, that's that. I mean, that's it, right? I mean, when we think about democracy and when we talk about democracy on democracy in danger, uh, you know, there's a sort of magnetic field that pulls us back to making it about elections or who the president is, and and we do our best to resist it, right? Because we want to get a bigger picture of what it means to be a citizen in a democratic republic, to take citizenship seriously. And part of that is being informed, and part of that is being concerned, and part of that is being connected, and part of that is there's a certain love of one's neighbors that we need as a baseline to do this kind of work. So, I mean, we're getting far afield from climate, but clearly you have made all these connections. How did you do that? Uh, (laughs) I read a lot. I talk to a lot of people. I um, watch a lot of superhero movies. Um, (laughs) (laughs) We need more superheroes. I mean, connecting shame, maybe let me put it this way. Do you think that in talking about shame, you're also hinting at the possibility of empathy on the other side of the coin, a sort of feeling about what it might be like to experience difficulty from somebody else's point of view. I mean, how does that, how can that unleash a sense of collective stewardship and care? Well, I mean, what shame does pretty effectively um, is it makes people adhere to the rules, right? So like the reason people in certain communities can run around without wearing a mask is because there's no social consequence to not wearing a mask. And in fact, what has been happening in some places is that it's the opposite, where you're the weirdo who wears a mask, right? Um, And so (laughs) the example, um, like I ended up reading an entire book about shame. And one of the examples that they 
posted as a really good and kind of effective use of shame is um, California does this thing where if you owe more than $100,000 in taxes, they send you a letter and they're like, you have until this day to pay. If you don't pay, we're going to post your name. Mm. We're going to call you publicly a deadbeat. And the threshold is kind of critical. If you owe $100,000 in in back taxes, you're not, you know, working at a fast food restaurant trying to make ends meet, right? (laughs) Like, like it is someone who generally probably has some social standing in their community and doesn't want their business on blast. My my gears are spinning because I grew up as a kid in Japan. Yeah, shame uh, culture. Yeah, I mean, shame is very strong in Japan, but so is honor, and so is following the rules and respect and sort of knowing your place in the hierarchy, all of which made me not really like living in Japan. (laughs) And so I'm looking for that way to flip it and say, yes, but with this sense of shame comes a sense of social uh, responsibility and a high degree of of sharing space together with other people, which, of course, the Japanese do really well. Um, So anyway, that's a very powerful image that you've set. And I I mean, I'm not like all in for blanket shaming at all times, but it's more like there are so many arguments that shame is inherently problematic. And I'm just seeing the opposite, which is that like because our culture is so individualistic, we don't actually talk enough about the things that we need to do in order to maintain social cohesion. Well, Kendra, thank you so much for joining us today on Democracy in Danger. Thanks so much for having me. That was Kendra Pierre-Lewis, a climate reporter and producer on the podcast, How to Save a Planet, and the author of Greenwashed, Why We Can't Buy Our Way to a Green Planet. Democracy in Danger is part of the Democracy Group Podcast Network. Visit democracygroup.org to find all of our sister shows. We'll be right back after this message from our friends. Do you think it's time to stop yelling about our differences and start solving them? Well, how do we fix it? Ask open-minded, often playful questions about how to make the world a better place. Co-hosts Richard Davies and Jim Meggs are longtime journalists, and they have been fed up with the media obsessing over clashes, conspiracies, and celebrities. For six years running, How Do We Fix It has looked at democracy through the lens of human behavior and philosophy, not just politics and current affairs. Recent episodes consider mental illness policy, vaccine concerns, and President Biden's infrastructure plan. Listen every week to How Do We Fix It, wherever you get your podcasts, and become part of the solution. Siva, your point about spilling over from discipline to discipline, area of expertise to area of expertise, I mean... We we always talk about being siloed. And the fact is that there are some things that we know about. And then there's lots of things that we don't know about. But I think the, you know, one of the things that's kind of wonderful about talking to a journalist in a field like science, which is multidisciplinary, is that you kind of have to be good at learning lots of things from policy questions to the science to to these kind of epistemological questions. Sure. You know, it's an it's an ecological approach. It's an ecological intellectual Position. And by that, I mean not just paying attention to ecosystems in their classic sense, but thinking about the interrelationship among different phenomenon, fields, things in the world, right? Paying attention to the way that one thing affects another. And you can't understand climate unless you think that way, right? You Mm -hmm. also can't understand how climate affects us without thinking that way, without understanding there is this direct relationship between agriculture and human migration, between human migration and political backlash in the destination country, right? Once you can draw those lines and think about it comprehensively, then you can begin to address the problem. If you address each of those problems distinctly, you are going to miss something. Mm -hmm. And, And also she was able to guide me anyway in really seeing a connection between democracy and a and an open flow of information and the ability to learn to adapt to change your mind to build coalitions around new information new facts you do need a democratic environment to allow that kind of transformation to occur and in the face of climate change in the face of other kinds of crises migration crises um, that is the way in which people as a society are going to be able to adapt and to repair yeah the problem. Uh, I just think that authoritarian or totalitarian regimes in which the state makes all the decisions 
are going to prove a lot less adaptable to the coming change. That's true. I mean, they might make solar panels faster, but that's not the total question or sufficient, right? I mean, you're right. Of course, they have the, ironically, have the, the power to impose change. Say, all right, t t tomorrow, no one's ever going to drive a car again. Right. But it's unlikely that they will, just because of the way the global economy works, that any of the major polluters, China, Russia, uh, in the in the non-democratic camp, are likely to make those kinds of decisions. So absolutely, absolutely. You know, one of the one of the things we can take from that as well, and I think the the thing that most thrilled me about our conversation with Kendra and of her work is the emphasis that it is all about shared obligation, and it's all about a shared sense of fate. Like we are all in this together. And I I know I've said this on the show many many times, but the essence of democracy is that recognition that we share a common fate. When that ethic collapses, that sense of shared destiny, that's when democracy is in danger. That's when things shake. And climate is the perfect example mm -hmm. of that. And as we see some of the reactions to climate change, the 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 individualization, right? This the idea of like, well, I shop at all the right places and I drive a Prius and I'm really good and green, right? That can have a tendency to exempt someone from a sense of shared responsibility because I'm flying the flag of, of righteousness here, right? That's just something I really worry about. But the beyond that, on the on the really bad side of that is I'm going to build a house higher on the hill. I'm going to crank up my air conditioner because the summer is a little too hot. I'm going to make sure that my family is comfortable. My family is safe. My family can ride out all of the storms and everyone down in the valley. Well, it's up to them. That disengagement is the real danger to democracy. There, there are there are abuses in in our democracy and in every democracy, no doubt about it. But I would go as far as to say that we're more likely to cultivate the kind of empathy you're talking about, the kind of empathy that Kendra is talking about in a well-functioning democracy than we are in an authoritarian regime that forces us to behave a certain way, whatever that, that manner may be. Empathy is something that requires connection. Yeah. That does it this week for Democracy in Danger. Next time, historian Gemma Santamaria will help us understand the state of democracy in one of our closest and most important neighbors, Mexico. People do not trust authorities. The police is not perceived as a legitimate actor by citizens, and crime has increased over the last decades. We are on Twitter a lot, and we want to hear from you. Our handle is at DND Podcast. That's D-I-N-D Podcast. Share your concerns about climate change and what you think are the most important political changes we need to make to do something about it. You can find a lot more background on this topic, plus links to Kendra's amazing photography on our webpage, dindanger.org. And be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your audio. Democracy in Danger is produced by Robert Armengold with help from Jennifer Ludovici. Our terrific interns are Denzel Mitchell and Jane Frankel. Support comes from the University of Virginia's Democracy Initiative and from the College of Arts and Sciences. The show is a project of UVA's Deliberative Media Lab. We are distributed by the Virginia Audio Collective, the podcast network of WTJU Radio in Charlottesville. I am Siva Vadianathan. And I'm Will Hitchcock. We'll catch you here next time. <laughs>